there. Let's get the next one up there. And then we're going to take care of some other business. I want y'all to hear about Sarah Vico's uh, lawsuit. We're going to start with that next. Let's get the vote. Then we'll go. Okay, next. Vice Chair for Constituency Group. There are two captains. B. Nguyen. B. Nguyen. You know, you win. You had to read it. It doesn't sound like it looks like it. You win. Uh, they will be uh, nominated by uh, Sheba Ruffin and Wendy Davis. Then Scout Smith, the other candidate, will be introduced by Donna Gray and Tom Johnson. So at this point, let me turn it over to you. Good afternoon, Georgia Democrats. All right. My name is Ashika Ruffin, and I stand proudly here today to nominate my friend, B. Wynn, as our party's next vice chair of the constituency group. Woo! 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 These projects have been, when everyone is included, everyone wins. And this is indicative of her commitment to public safety and public service, also to community and to Georgia as a whole. B is a fearless advocate for women and girls, for communities of color, for veterans, and for marginalized communities all across our state. And this has been shown by her dedication to making sure that everyone has a voice at the table and everyone is included in decision making. So much so that when she had her historic bid as being Georgia's first Vietnamese American um, member of house, she was intentional about making sure that everyone in her constituency was included and also part of her policy making um, goals. So not only y'all does B know how to win, she knows how to bring voices to the table that have been traditionally marginalized and excluded from the conversation. She also knows how to assemble an amazing team that is a true reflection of Georgia's values and what we actually look like. If you guys don't believe me, just take a look at her legislative district and her legislative office and see how diverse it really is. So this is the type of leadership that we need for our party. In order to truly win, not only must we make sure that all voices are included, we also need to make sure that all voices are counted. Woo! There's a funny story that I remember uh, with B, and we talk about it often. Um, as a couple of months ago, we were um, uh, canvassing throughout the district on behalf of some amazing Democrats that were on the ticket. And we came upon a gentleman who did not want to talk to B because of the color of her skin. And instead of shying away from that challenge, B embraced it. She began to tell her personal story as a, a child of immigrant parents and also a daughter of a veteran. And she was able to connect with him, with him in a way that I had never seen before. So much so that by the end of the conversation, not only did he give her a hug, a kiss, and committed to vote for the amazing Democrats on our, on our team, she also began to have further conversations with him. She was able to connect with him and um, make him understand that it's our difference that makes us so amazing as Georgians. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to stand here before you today to nominate B. Wynn as our next Vice Chair of Constituency Group. And I ask you humbly for your vote for her for, to, for we have, so we can have a more inclusive and diverse Georgia. Thank you guys so much. And remember, Good afternoon. I want y'all to, if you're in the back, you can see it. But if you're in the front, I want y'all to take a look around. Twist your neck around. Don't break your neck. But look at this room. So not only is it standing room only, but it looks like Georgia. Think for a minute about the other party in our state. If they had a room with this many party leaders in it, how many people of color would it be? Lots of color. All right? This vice chair position, this vice chair position is about making sure our diversity is strong in every way you can think about diversity. And I will tell you, I have been watching B, and she works her fanny off. And how she connects with people is with authenticity and with understanding that you have to be intentional about what you do. I've been around, there's seven people in this room who were young Democrats back in the late 80s when I was. Been around a long time. She's going to do it. She's going to reach out to the state, and our caucuses are not 
little subsets of the people in this room. Our caucuses are how we grow the party, and B will do that, and we will win with B. and I'm running for vice chair for constituency groups. Now my original plan was to come up here and tell you what I'm gonna get done if elected to this position. But instead of talking about how I intend on working with our caucuses to build a strategic plan to win in 2020 and win in 2022, or how I'll finally get to put my English degree to some good use and put together a communications plan to uplift the vision of our caucus groups, my heart is pulled in a different direction. On Tuesday evening, I attended a sit-in on the deportation of Southeast Asians. In this space, people began to share their stories of incarceration. Black, brown, yellow, and white. U.S. born and foreign born. People from every part of our state. Common themes began to emerge. Mass incarceration, the war on drugs, distrust in the police, the for-profit prison system, the destabilization of the family unit, and the recognition that immigrant detention is an extension of the criminal justice system in America, and that we can and we must unite. In this space, I witnessed starkly different communities come together over a shared issue, one that has devastated their lives and the lives of their loved ones. I sat in the back of the room and I cried the entire time. I had nothing to offer in my role as a state representative or in my role as a Georgia Democrat. I was overcome with this sentiment. This is a group that I want to be a part of. This is the type of community building I want to see in Georgia. This is the type of coalition building that we are capable of creating. My own personal life began to feel small and inconsequential compared to the pain endured by the people in front of me. And in that moment, I thought, this is how survival comes first and voting comes secondary. I have never been a believer of voter apathy. What I've come to recognize is that the 2.5 million registered voters who stayed at home in 2018 were busy surviving, or they didn't believe in a system that has failed them, or they did not believe that their voices mattered, or we just simply did not ask them to vote. That's right. I know this to be true because this is the story of my parents. I am the daughter of former refugees who fled from Vietnam in the late 70s. And before my family escaped, my father was held a prisoner of war in his own country. When Saigon fell and civilians were asked to turn themselves into what they were told to be one or two weeks of what they called re-education camp to learn about their new form of government, my father, who was 25 years old at the time, turned himself in and he was sentenced to three years for his service as a lieutenant in the medical army. He was held in a remote prison in the middle of the jungle and subjected to hard labor and starvation. And when he was released, my parents decided to flee their country in the middle of the night. I was raised in a typical immigrant household. My parents taught us to study hard and to keep our heads down. They believed that the key to escaping poverty was education. And they were right, but they never taught me how to vote or to become civically engaged. And they never taught me how to speak up when something was wrong. They loved a country that didn't enable them to elect us who represented them and didn't enable them to dissent from their government without the fear of retaliation. As a child, I recognized something was missing, but I couldn't quite identify why the pervasive silence in my household made me feel so helpless. Looking back as an adult, I recognized that my parents felt disempowered, and I felt helpless because I did not know how to fix that. This sense of helplessness and the desire to give my parents everything that was taken away from them is at the root of everything I have done leading up to this moment. My parents are the reason I have spent the last 10 years of my life working in under-resourced public high schools through the nonprofit I started to educate and empower young women. My parents are the reason I managed the campaign for Representative Sam Park and built a broad-based coalition reaching out to constituencies who are so often left behind. They are the reason I recruited over a thousand volunteers for Georgia Democrats in 2018 and knocked on over 30,000 doors for Stacey Abrams, and Sarah Ray Amigo, and the rest of our Georgia Democrats. <laughs> but this is the truth. No matter how much I accomplish, I'm not sure my parents will ever feel empowered. Just a few weeks ago, when I was elected and sworn in, my parents were out on the house floor with me, which is nothing short of a miracle. And my mother pulled me aside and she said she felt uncomfortable because her English wasn't good enough. And she asked me to take her out of the chambers. And I cannot think of a worse feeling than watching the two people you love the most in the world feel powerless. 
And that is why I do what I do. That is why I have fought so hard all of my life to make sure everybody has a voice at, it, at the table. And why I'll fight hard to build a party where everybody feels valued and everybody feels heard. Because I know all of us at some point in our lives have wrestled with the feelings of powerlessness and the feelings of insignificance, and especially in a space like politics, where being human often comes secondary. So most of all, I'm here because I don't want anyone to ever feel the way that my parents feel. Which is why I'm asking you for your vote as the next vice chair for constituency groups, because I am here to work together to build a party where nobody is left behind. Thank you.